Hello, everyone. I hope you're joining me here. I'm going to wait a few minutes for people to sign on and let me know where you are listening from because I'm really curious to know where everyone is in the world. Uh, my name is Julia Radosh, and I currently live in Bratislava, Slovakia. I'm an American soprano. Um, my husband, he is soon to be husband on August 8th. He is a Slovak conductor, so that is why we are here in Europe. Um, but yes, I am American and I grew up in Orlando, Florida. So welcome everybody. I was just saying, um, if you don't mind dropping your location in the comments, I'd love to see where you're listening from. And thanks for joining me here. Um, as you may have noticed, just a little bit of housekeeping. I put in the comments, if you haven't joined our Whistle Voice Workshop group, it's a private group, and I invite you to join that on Facebook because in it, we're doing some challenge questions, and we are also going to have some homework assignments each day. So for the challenge questions, um, for every completed answer, you will get entered into win a mini laser session with me. And for the homework assignments, oh, cool. Everybody is listening here. Oh my gosh, so many places. Let's see, we have Sweden, Philippines, Northern Ireland. Oh my gosh, New Hampshire, Philly, Oxford, UK. Oh, beautiful. Amsterdam, Northern Utah, Brooklyn, New York, PA. Cali, wow, it's awesome. So everybody's from around the world. Anyways, as I was saying, the homework assignments each day, um, these are going to be for a very special scholarship to my upcoming group program, which I will tell you about on the last day. But without further ado, now that we have a bunch of people joining us already, I would like to begin. So I want to first begin with a question, which I did ask in the group, again, which I suggest that you join. Um, but I want to ask, what sound quality, what adjective would you use to describe the whistle voice or the whistle register? If you can just quickly drop one word that comes to mind and let me see in the comments. Let's see. Okay, I'm not getting any comment responses yet. Clean. Okay, there we go. There might be a lag between StreamYard, so I apologize for that. Um, clean, ethereal, yes. Okay, good. I'm going to get started as I'm waiting. Small, small, light. Oh, yeah, exactly. Pure. Okay, so I'm going to begin talking about with a story of my experience finding my own whistle register and what happened. So I would say this is about two years into my rehabilitative vocal studies with my wonderful teacher. After um, years singing in college in a way that was a bit pressed and not authentic. So I had had two years of study where I was really learning to let go of the press, especially in my second passaggio. So things were really picking up for me at this point. I was working. I was winning competitions, so the voice was functioning, right, pretty well. And one day I was in a rehearsal, and if anyone is in the comments here from Bronx Opera, who was in the Poison Kiss with me, maybe you will remember this moment. But we were singing this, uh, I was holding a high A flat, like A flat below high C, for about 16 feet but like really long stretched out 16 beats over the whole um, chorus and orchestra. And it was during a rehearsal. And I remember saying to myself, let me see if I can decrescendo this. So I'm holding this A flat and I decrescendo to what I feel is like, you know, a really great place. And then all of a sudden when I'm there, my voice shoots up an octave all the way to A flat seven, above high C. So I think for Europeans, that's A flat four. And I was absolutely shocked. I thought I had broken my voice. 
I didn't know what had happened. It was like one of those moments, I just stopped singing. So I talked to my teacher about it and he's like, oh, well, let's hear it. I couldn't replicate it on command at this point, but I started kind of practicing it, trying to get it loosened up and I started to find it. It was very particular moments during the day when I was relaxed that I could sort of find it. And I started playing around with it and then I eventually was able to show it to my teacher and said, great, this is the whistle function, this is fantastic. So we started using it in some vocal exercises. Um, and I started diving down the rabbit hole of Google and trying to find studies and research on the whistle voice. And I would say this was about 2011, I want to say, 2000, yeah, 2011, 2012. So there really wasn't like, you know, the internet was definitely around, I'm not saying it wasn't, but there was a little bit less on the internet at this point. And I really couldn't find much on the whistle voice and its function. But I do remember finding this one article, and I won't name any names, but it was a very famous pedagogue who warned against false vocal cord whistle function. And this was really one of the only things I could find. So immediately in my, you know, young singer mind, I thought, oh my God, this is maybe what I'm doing because I can't find any information on this. I don't really know anyone who's singing like this. I've literally never heard this sound come out of a human being before. Okay. And oh wait, somebody says, I've had that happen, but never been able to do it on purpose. Yeah. I find it has happened to me when I feel swollen or more irritated weirdly. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll get... I'll get to that a little bit later, later, Maya. Um, and Kim says, yeah, I've seen the article. Okay, right. So this is one of the only things I could find on whistle voice. And I thought, well, I've never heard the sound come out of a human before. And there seems to be no information on this. So perhaps this is what it is. Perhaps this is false vocal cord whistle function. And oh my God, if you read the case studies on there, it's horrible. It's like so terrible and you're so scared, right? So I kind of proceeded with caution. We kept doing the whistle voice exercises, but I sort of took a step back at this point. I thought, mm, I'm not sure I want to go here. So eventually I stopped sort of using that registrational practice, except when I was in my lessons. And I found that this was really difficult because at the same time I was making a Fach shift from being a light lyric coloratura repertoire, singing more heavier lyric repertoire bordering on spinto. So I stopped this whistle voice function. And it actually, at the same time, started developing a lot of issues in my upper register. And to make a long story short, I'll go into this at a later date, but to make a long story short, removing whistle register phonation out of my daily practice was one of the major contributing factors to suffering some problems in the top and in the second passaggio. So long story short, everything's better. And whistle voice is a mainstay of my current vocal hygiene routine every single day. Now, I do want to talk about the um, fluctuation of the whistle register. This is a register that is extremely volatile and can sort of be tossed around by the forces of nature. So if you haven't slept, if you're a little dehydrated, if you're feeling a little sick, a little swollen, any kind of premenstrual syndrome can show up. So the whistle register is a bit unreliable. Um, in that sense and that it can really you know if you're having normal issues with your voice it might lessen or disappear um so that is something to keep in mind but that doesn't mean that it's not worth exercising or attempting every day but i will get in tomorrow to more of how to work the whistle register and when to maybe lay off for a little bit so now i want to jump to a little bit of history of the whistle voice, okay? Um, what is the whistle register? So here's some historical background 
One of the earliest documenting writings of Whistle Register was in a letter to his wife by Leopold Mozart, it was dated March 24, 1770. And he wrote of a soprano, Lucrezia Alguari, spectacular high notes, describing the vocal quality as a little softer than the lower notes, but she sang them beautifully like the fluted sounds of an organ. And Leopold was also known to use the term flagellet for this register. So other terms you may have heard for this register are flute voice, bird voice. Um, Matilda Marchese writes about the tiny oo, which is definitely a function of the whistle voice phonation. You can hear that tiny oo, but it's also a practical application, which we will get to tomorrow. Um, and Garcia obviously writes about the whistle register as well. Now, there was a study done by a gentleman named J. Stephen Walker in 1988, in which there was about 42 samples of female voices and singing the same pitch in head voice versus whistle voice. And almost without fail, every expert that was listening was able to identify the difference versus head voice registration and whistle voice registration. So this is really important to note because it really shows us that the whistle registration phonation is not just a function of pitch. It is an actual function of the voice. And I want you to keep this in mind as we go on because the less we can kind of marry the sense of whistle register to high notes, I think the healthier it's going to be for the whole entire instrument. Um, okay, so each of these registers has a very distinct sound. And there is scientific proof to back up that whistle register is indeed different from head voice phonation. Now, I will just say, this is for me to you. If you go on YouTube, okay, or you even just go on the blogs right now, and even some very well-meaning blogs, you will hear people claim that they know exactly what the function of whistle voice is produced by, like in terms of the vocal cords, what the vocal cords are actually doing when whistle voice is happening or occurring. The truth is there are many theories. So we don't really know definitively yet. And there's a couple reasons for that. One of the main reasons is that there hasn't been a large enough study, a sample of professional singers who are able to produce these tones on command and have the accurate like stroboscopic view to see what's happening. Now, there's a little bit of research, and I'm going to share this with you right now so you can kind of see how they're viewing the, the whistle register function. Okay, so the theories back in the day, earliest scientific investigations of the whistle register were performed by Banke, Shakespeare, and Prochowski during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And their research was based on laryngoscopic observations and what they thought was an open glottis mechanism. So their, their theory supposed that the vocal folds didn't close or even vibrate during the production of whistle register and that what why we hear that whistle register sound is because the air is whistling past um, the lips of the vocal folds. Okay, that was one early theory since disproven. Um, there was another theory that suggested that phonation and whistle register resulted not from the vibration of the vocal folds, but rather from the formation of eddies in a triangular opening between the arytenoid cartilages and the cavity residence. Okay, so that is also not true, not, not what's happening, but these were early theories. So the more recent studies have shown that the vocal folds are fully elongated and they show vibration along the entire length of the folds. The glottis may not close completely. Now I do know that there is, a, there are a lot of people writing that the anterior portion of the vocal cords are definitely approximating in whistle register phonation. I think what I would say about that is it depends. 
And we'll get to a little bit more about that, but I will say briefly that there are variances in how whistle register is produced. Now, if we're gonna talk about pure whistle register phonation, not coordinated whistle register phonation, I would hypothesize, and it would be a beautiful thing if someone would do a study about this um, one day, which may happen, um, but I hypothesize that the closed anterior portion of the cords occurs when there is a coordination with the head voice. But again, that is just a theory. Stroboscopic views on one untrained female singer showed when maximally closed, there remained a glottal gap along the whole vocal fold length. So the vocal folds did not touch each other during vibration. Um, there was another one in 2012 that basically showed there was no glottal contact between E flat six and G five. They had a singer go up and down in a glissando and they saw that there was no glottal contact between E flat six and G five. And then the glottis made contact again below G five. So that kind of supports the fact that the glottis isn't fully closing on whistle register phonation. But again, that was one, you know, a couple singers that wasn't a large sample. Um, what we do know is there is definitely a longer opening phase in whistle register phonation than there is in head register phonation. So what an opening phase means is that the vocal cords are open a lot longer than they are closed. So again, it's kind of like, do we know for sure that they never meet? Not really. Okay. And this is why we need more studies done on this. Another thing that we do know is that there is a reduction in vocal fold contact area in whistle register compared to head register. And again, the open phase is significantly longer, plus the findings indicated reduced vocal fold oscillation and a constantly open glottis. So now this supports that there's not so much oscillation in the vocal folds, although there is, and the glottis does remain open. The other thing that we do know is that compared to phonation and other registers, whistle register uses less airflow. Now, I'm gonna just step in here and I'm gonna give a little bit of my theories on this. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Um, can you please explain the difference between whistle and head voice on the same note, please? Yeah, okay, so essentially whistle register, we're talking about a different laryngeal setup. Okay, so a head register note, you can, you can have the same note. So let's see if we do, if we go, which is in head register and we go, that's a little low for whistle register, but I think you can hear the difference. So if it, so that's not just a softer tone, that's an actual different function, a different mechanism. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about the difference between whistle register phonation and head register phonation. It's just like down low, we have chest voice and head voice. So I could sing, ah, uh, or I could sing, ah, uh, and have it a little bit more mixed. Um, okay, so those are just functions again. Is the whistle voice also called the super head voice? Yeah, it is. It is, but again, this is there is some de debate about using that term because it kind of implies that we're just singing in higher head voice, which some people do still believe in. Um, and this is where I want to insert my own hypotheses based on my own personal experience and the experience of my clients. Um, I will tell you, I have yet to meet a client that walks into my studio and cannot phonate in whistle register, um, at least you know within a first couple lessons, because essentially what it is is it's just a different way to approach the singing. Now that doesn't mean that they all of a sudden have the craziest high notes in the world. No, it means that they're able to access that different register transition. Okay, so I want to be very clear about that. Please separate in your mind whistle register meaning i'm going to have the super craziest high notes in the world you might actually that may happen but you also might not 
you might just find you have a few extra notes, but they're not really going to be performed, but they make everything easier. Okay, so my hypothesis about this is that the whistle register takes a lot, a lot less intrinsic laryngeal musculature. So it feels really easy to sing in the whistle register. In fact, you can almost sing all day in it. You could, I mean, I'm, I don't recommend that, by the way. Please don't do that. But you could because it feels so just not difficult. Um, there's another thing about the whistle register that is interesting. It's about support. There's a different kind of support that comes in with whistle register phonation. And you actually don't need as much support in the traditional sense. So you can you kind of have the sense that you're almost singing from here up when it's relaxed. Almost if you're and I could just like keep that going on and on. I won't do that because it's boring, but <laughs> you can. Okay. So those are my theories about whistle register. Now, I do meet occasionally some higher voices, usually color tour sopranos, that will say, I don't believe in the whistle, whistle register. And they can sing their Queen of the Nights with full voice Fs. And that is great, like totally awesome. Um, I will say that it is possible to use a coordinated whistle and not know that you have the pure whistle voice function. So if you've got rock and high notes, chances are you probably already know how to do this. You might not just not know how to separate it. And I mean, do you need to? I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you feel like you do. Maybe you don't need to in your own mind. So that's a personal artistic decision. But I would say that there is a point in the range that it, regardless of who you are, what repertoire you sing, there is a potential there, depending on your voice type, to integrate um, a little bit more pure whistle into your singing with the potential of developing even higher notes. So now I'm going to get to the contemporary views of whistle voice and whistle register. Unfortunately, Right now, we're in this really amazing time. We have a lot of wonderful pop divas like Mariah Carey, Ariana Grande, and if we go back to the 70s, Minnie Riperton, she's awesome. Um, but they are sort of the ones that are really championing the whistle voice and whistle register. And you don't hear this as much in operatic singing anymore because my personal opinion on this is that orchestration got heavier with um, Verismo opera. So we, the voice types, like if you look at the bel canto way of singing and kind of the instruction with the skill sets, flagellate whistle register was one of the skills that was cultivated in treble voices. It just was. And then when we started getting later, you know, heavier operas, fuller orchestration, um, you notice with the tenors, in fact, the tenors used to sing their um, high notes in kind of a voix mix, where they would be mixing falsetto with, on like the high C. And then what happened was one tenor did full voiced high C, and then that sort of became the norm. So that's why we have full, tenor high notes, but in a lot of the French repertoire that was written, that actually wasn't the aesthetic at the time. I think a similar thing happened with um, sopranos, actually, because the flagellate, if you go on, and I think I dropped a link in the video down at the bottom, where you will see a YouTube video of operatic sopranos. Most of them are from pre-1950, okay? I think there's like Natalie to say and Diana Damrau and then Katarzyna Dondarska, I think. I, okay, there's like maybe three that are more recent, but most of them are from previous times. And you can hear very clearly that their super, super top notes sound very different from what we think of as like 
you know, if you think of the end of Traviata or you think of Lucia's mad scene, what we're used to hearing today in terms of the E flat production is slightly different. Again, I'm not going to say that that as a rule that no one does that in a whistle register phonation because I'm not at the opera house every single night hearing everybody, but I do think that it's become the norm that those notes are sung fuller. So the whistle register has a bit become a neglected registration within the operatic world, but in the CCM world, it hasn't. And there is a whistle voice renaissance, which I noticed because I am obviously an opera singer and I have a YouTube channel, Voice with Julia, which I'm right now live streaming to YouTube. And I had no idea that this was going to be a hot thing on YouTube. But when I put in whistle voice and I made my first video, that was the very first video I ever made, I was getting a lot of comments, completely unknown YouTube channel at the time. And I realized that this was being a widely searched topic. But most of the videos made about what the whistle voice is, how to use the whistle voice, how to find it, were all from a CCM perspective. Um, so I think that there is a little bit of a, a disjunct in between the classical world now using whistle voice and um, the CCM world. So now I wanna get to what can be possible with developing the whistle register. And I have to do a huge, huge shout out to a wonderful soprano and pedagogue. Her name is Allison Holmes Ben Dixon. She wrote one of the most fascinating dissertations and I read all 200 pages of it. Um, she wrote this in 2013 and her study was, uh, if you aren't familiar with, you know, how an operatic degree dissertation goes, you run a scientific study and you test your hypotheses and then you write a really long paper about it. So this is what Allison did. And her hypothesis was that regular exercise of purposeful whistle register phonation improves pressed phonation in the second passaggio and it increases range and ease in the upper register of the entire voice. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a recap because, you know, I, I actually really suggest you read the 200 page dissertation if you're so inclined and I will drop a link to that. And again, huge shout out to Allison. I hope to have her come on um, in my Technique Talks group one day and talk about her study. It, she wasn't able to get a electroglottography on the actual function, but she was able to determine without fail that yes, purposeful whistle register phonation exercises improve the second passaggio and increase range and ease in the upper register. So this is not just a function for extreme high notes, but the cultivation of the whistle register actually cultivates overtones and ease of function in the entire instrument. Okay, and it's not just for coloratura sopranos. It should be used by every voice and specifically treble voices. Okay, so I, you know, if, if you're a man, yes, and you're singing pop, definitely like go for the whistle voice. If you're singing opera, you may or may not need it, but I think it's cool and I think it's healthy to explore all of the registers of our voice. Um, and I do believe that it is absolutely necessary vocal hygiene for all voices, especially treble voices. Um, so right now I'm going to end our discussion for today and I want to open the floor up to you if you have any questions Tomorrow, we are going to be learning exercises. So we're actually going to get into the nitty gritty and we're going to find and learn how to cultivate the pure whistle function and discover the technical blocks that might be blocking you from discovering that register. So that's what we will be doing tomorrow. And I hope to see you there. So if you have questions about that, just hang on for tomorrow because we will be getting there. But if you have any questions right now about the history of whistle register, um, let's see. Okay, Becky says, I feel like my marking might actually be whistle voice. You know what? It totally, totally could, Becky, because 
I recall I had a church job, you know, years ago and the conductor, he was really wonderful, but he kept saying, shh, shh, shh. And we were singing up on F5 the whole time, like just one note after another for maybe eight measures. Finally, I just said, okay, he keeps saying shh. So I just dropped into whistle register phonation and it was so much easier. And then he's like, bravo, sopranos, that was fantastic. So I just continued to do that. So yeah, Becky, totally, it could be. Um, there is an interesting function because you, it, it's hard to tell sometimes if you are doing a, like just a really quiet, pure head tone because a pure head tone feels a little bit different than a pure whistle tone. So yeah, yeah, if you had a dime for every time you were shushed, yeah, I feel you on that, totally. Yeah, the pure head tone can also have this kind of childlike quality. Um, I would describe the difference as, you know what? Here's what I would say about that. The pure head tone still feels like there's support under it. So it might be super, super quiet, but you feel like the body is really engaged still. Um, with whistle register, it really feels like, I feel like if I support it all, the whistle register goes out the window. So it really depends. Like that would be something, you know, you'd have to play around with and listen like to the difference in quality and the difference in kinesthetic awareness on those notes. So those can be a little tricky to, to distinguish if you're down low. I think if you're up high, it's pretty easy to tell if you're in whistle voice because you know, if you're not a coloratura singing super high notes, like there's only one way to get there. Okay, so um, is the teaching of whistle still happening in opera voice teaching? Ugh. Yeah, okay. I obviously haven't had the experience of, you know, having lessons with many different teachers, but I do have a lot of colleagues, a lot of clients that had former vo voice teachers and voice coaches, and I do feel that it is something that isn't being dressed enough in the opera world. Um, I do feel that there's a little bit of, uh, what's the word, uh, trepidation. I would say trepidation about teaching this because it's not necessarily in and of itself a viable sound. Um, I do know there's still even debate right now in the lower voice world of like baritones and tenors about if falsetto is helpful for the development of the upper register. They're still, they're still debating about that, even though like most people know that, yes, you need a falsetto to have good and easy high notes. Um, and I think that holds true for the whistle register, absolutely. But unfortunately, I do think that's a few decades behind even the male falsetto on that one. Um, so yeah. I will say one more thing about whistle register as we move into tomorrow where we're going to be doing the exercises. I think it's really important to note that if you have a fuller voice type, there's going to be a more significant break between your full voice singing and even your full voice head voice and the whistle register. If you're a lighter voice, there may not be as much of a break. So what that means for you is that if you are a lighter voice, those whistle register notes may become actual viable pitches for you. If you're a bigger voice, the whistle register notes may not ever become fully viable notes, but I will say that with the coordinated whistle, you can extend your range. Oh, and that is what I wanted to say. This is important with Allison's dissertation it was shown that regular whistle voice phonation every day during the treatment periods showed a 2.2 average of a 2.2 semitone gain in range. So just with doing whistle voice phonation, and that does not mean necessarily dragging up the whistle voice as high as you can go. It means just using the register. So you can use it in a comfortable place, which we'll learn about tomorrow. 2.2 sem semitones, that is huge. I mean, especially if you're a lyric soprano, you'll know that's the difference between maybe singing a role or not. So that is a really big, big deal. Okay, we hear, why aren't Broadway singers whistling much? I, I have no idea, <laughs> honestly. Um, I don't know, I think that maybe some do. I think maybe some in Phantom of the Opera do have to do that, but I, I don't know. Um, 
when I started singing, my D6 to A6 is obviously made my second passaggio easier, but I'm not sure if I was using my whistle register. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, if you say D6 to A6, if, I, if you're actually talking about what I think you're talking about, I would say that's probably whistle register. But again, who knows? We'd have to hear it. Um, I've been struggling with avoiding press pronation in my head voice to relieve it. I feel like I've been going towards the whistle register, but then I am told I'm singing off voice. Yeah, so that is definitely something to consider because <laughs> the, this idea of on the voice and off the voice gets very tricky if we are talking about whistle register. Um, I do have to say, we have to be very careful. Like, I don't want to say definitively, you are definitely singing in whistle register if I haven't heard you, have no idea. So it could be that you're just not supporting and there's a pure head tone. Again, like I was saying to someone before, the pure head tone can also be sort of unsupported, but it does feel like a different function. Another way you can tell between pure head tone and whistle is the whistle function, you feel nothing, like not even anything, okay? Pure head, you still feel like you're singing, okay? It doesn't feel like nothing. Um, what should the armature look like for whistle wide versus round? Okay, good question. We're gonna get to that tomorrow. Typically, to find it and to cultivate it, you want this little tiny ooh. But as you get um, a little bit more experience with the register, you can open that up. Um, so that is a very good question. Yes, okay, so you all, I am so excited to have you here for the next couple days because tomorrow we're gonna dive into exercises, which is gonna be really fun. Um, and I, your homework assignment today is <laughs> to go into the group, okay? And I want you to write me what are the sensations Go play around, first of all, go play around a little bit and write me the sensations that you feel in your body, in your kinesthetic awareness, when you think you're phonating in whistle register. Okay, so again, the homework is you're going to write me the sensations that you feel in your body, in your throat, in your breath system, whatever, like all the details you have and put that in the group. Okay, so that is your homework to enter a very special prize. So thank you guys for so much for joining me and I will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. I hope that everything was smooth. I hope that the comments weren't arriving to beyond when I was speaking. But anyways, thanks for joining me and I will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye.